Hello, Beak Squad. David Burns with you today. Good to be with you. Thanks for joining me. Got a great uh, lineup tonight. Going to have Tom Copenhaver with us here in just a little bit. He is an outstanding beekeeper. He's got some great uh, stories to tell about his beekeeping journey. And he's got some good tips for us in just a little bit, too, about uh, how to deal with all the tax stuff and accounting on beekeeping and running beekeeping as a business. So it'd be fun to talk to Tom in just a minute. And we want to thank tonight's uh, hostess with the most is Jessica Fairfax is with us tonight. And I believe Jessica is scheduled to be with us uh, being interviewed next Thursday night. So she's a great beekeeper and we're going to be talking to her. You guys get to know her a little bit better. You've only seen her comment. So you'll be, uh, you'll be able to talk to Jessica and ask her questions next week. So that'd be fun. I hope your day's going well. I see a lot of you in here from all across the planet, all across the U.S. I'm David Burns, EAS Certified Master Beekeeper. EAS stands for Eastern Apicultural Society of North America. I was certified back in 2010, which seems like forever ago. And uh, I've always enjoyed uh, being a uh, part of Eastern Apicultural Society's conference once a year. So if you watch any of my videos, you know that I talk about EAS and the conferences. And uh, we always have a good time out there. And that's where a lot of people try to become a master beekeeper. And uh, it's always fun to work with new master beekeeper candidates. But that's another story for another time. Hey, guys, I, I want to let you know that uh, every Thursday night, 7 p.m., mark that in your calendar. Um, I want to let you know we've got some exciting things coming up that I'm going to be announcing. I don't know when, but Sherry and I have been working on them and uh, might be announcing them probably before Thanksgiving. I'm not sure yet, but it's going to be some exciting things for all of you guys to take advantage of. So keep uh, keep your eye to the videos and all, and I'll be uh, bringing you up to date. It's been cold and rainy. Uh, Illinois is kind of rough right now. Not too cold, but cool, I guess is a better word, in the 50s Fahrenheit. So can't go out there and do much inside the hives, uh, maybe until another couple of days. So um, been having fun. I've been making some videos, almost got one published today, but we had to take care of another issue here at the honeybee farm that took me away from editing. So you know how that goes. Well, let's bring in tonight's guests. You guys are going to like Tom. Welcome, Tom. How are you tonight? Hello, David. I'm doing quite well. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, I need an applause button, a big, you know, yay, sound effects. I think I can do that. I have to get more savvy with uh, my live stream here. But Tom, you, uh, I, I met you, Tom, and you've been a part of uh, the B Team 6 mentoring program. Um, and uh, we have talked a lot uh, by me helping you over the years and got acquainted. And uh, so it's been fun getting to know you. It's fun to see you in person. And uh, looking forward to sharing with you. I think you have a lot to share Oops, with my listeners tonight, those that are watching. I think you have a lot to share, both with beekeeping, because you've made a tremendous um, change or a journey in your beekeeping uh, endeavors. And then also your background in accounting. I think that's going to be a big help for a lot of people that are always asking kind of business questions. I get asked that a lot. How do you start a beekeeping business. So let me start off, Tom, by uh, asking you some things right off the top, I guess, uh, when it comes to tonight's live stream. What about, uh, let's talk about what do you hate the most and like the most about beekeeping? Boy, that's, I love the honey. <laughs> that's you love the, the honey? That's, that's my favorite part. Okay. And my least favorite is getting stung. Oh, Yeah. Uh, other people have said that's their least uh, thing they hated most is about being stung. Yeah. There's a lot more that I hate about beekeeping than being stung. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what I like best is the, the whole journey of beekeeping. Yeah. Um, when I started out, I thought I was a pretty bright guy and knew what I was doing. And um, I needed to be humbled and the bees did that in short order. And once I understood that there was so much more to learn, you know, the more you learn, the more you're aware of your own ignorance. And then there's even more to learn. That is and so it's, true. it's a continuing cycle. And I, I think that's the number one thing is to learn about the bees and then have somebody like you uh, uh, have given me so much help. Um, but once you get going and, and start to get a rhythm and, and understand the process, and then it gets fun. 
Yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, so let's talk about, why don't you just kind of tell us, Tom, about, um, I don't know, how did you, what was your journey into beekeeping? How, how did you get into beekeeping? Well, it started with a shiny, flashy email from Tractor Supply. Oh, wow. It said I should own bees. And I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. I should. So um, this would have been about January 2018 uh, or 2017. And I waited and waited. And those bees finally showed up in May dead. Oh, wow. In a package? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't find anybody that had bees. So I ended up waiting a whole nother year to get bees. And mm -hmm. I, instead of ordering them and having them shipped, I went to an apiary and bought nukes. Mm -hmm. And that worked out really well. And, and from there, I went, I started out that first year in 2018 with four colonies and overwintered them. Things went well, got a little honey out of them. Um, and then I've just grown every year mm -hmm. until I had uh, at one point 18 colonies and they were all dead by January, mm. maybe February. Wow. That's when I, um, that's where you came in and started showing me the ropes and showing me that, Hey, you got to learn this stuff. Yeah. And now, um, it's it's astonishing the difference you know where i would get a hundred pounds of honey in the past now i'll get a thousand in a certain certain area wow so it's a tangible uh, measurable difference oh yeah that's great how did you find out about me how did you connect with me <laughs> that's a funny story i was listening to rock and roll on my computer uh, on youtube but just randomly playing music and then all of a sudden there was your smiling face and I thought, who's this guy? I, you know, I was looking for some Led Zeppelin. I got David Burns. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I couldn't turn it off. It was a, it was a, an interesting video about, um, as I recall, the subject of the, the B portion was, it was about um, fall feeding and things like that. But you were talking a lot to you at a coffee time. I love your coffee time segments. That's, thank you. that's what drew me to you. Oh, thank you. I, I like the way you think and yeah. philosophize. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you were talking about your family and Christmas past and Christmas present, Christmas future. And I thought, yeah, I, I, I ended up watching most of your videos or as many as I could and, uh, ordered your classes, joined the, B team six and that's been a great help and it's it's fun to be able to correspond with you and I appreciate that good wow so you know there is David Burns the rock star so I, I thought maybe you would have talking maybe, heads yeah talking heads maybe they pulled that maybe the algorithm threw me in there because they knew they got the wrong oh, David yeah, Burns. maybe that's <laughs> it yeah I was at EAS last year and everybody kept oh, this this one lady in particular kept talking to me about you know David Burns from Talking Head, don't you? And I was like, I've heard of him, but she's like, oh my gosh, his videos were so great. His his music videos were tremendous back then, you know. And I was like, I don't know if I remember that. So she made me watch some of his videos, and I was like, that's, that's pretty cool. But that's great. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you found me and got a, got connected with me. And uh, yeah, it's been great helping you with your bees. Uh, you've really learned a lot. You've you seem to have picked up on beekeeping pretty fast. Well, that's that's because I, well, the the reading list. I, I don't know if you can put a link up, but the the EAS has a list of recommended books. Uh, I think that's for the Master Beekeeper program. Hmm. Uh, there's some great material in those books, and I I think the more you learn, the better you are at anything. Yeah. So I've been I, ha I have your book, and yeah. uh, it's still in the plastic, but um, not for long. I, yeah. Anyway, the, the, uh, the, the education is the number one thing. And it, you want to start a bee business. You have to know what you're doing. You can't start a welding business if you don't know how to weld. Yeah. Uh, you can't start a farm if you don't know how to operate a tractor. You have to yeah. learn. It doesn't yeah, matter right. what business it is. Yeah. And with that's beekeeping, that's I think as you learn, you can grow your business, but don't, don't jump into it uh, and get ahead of yourself. Yeah. 
Well, that's right. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me, how, how do you start a bee business? What, how, what methods do I go and go by and all that? But um, a bee business is pretty much like any business. You have to follow the same procedures for the most part. Um, you know, you have to know what you're going to, you got to know your profit, your losses. You have to kind of know your clients. You have to kind of know what you are going to try to sell, what you're going to try to, how you're going to make money on honey or whatever. You have to, you have to be business savvy to some extent. It's, it's like running any other business in that sense. And for the most part, the tax laws and the, I guess the incorporations and all are the same, but it is a little bit different when it comes to farm because a lot of times most beekeeping businesses, and especially ones that are involved in bees, it, it is a farm. So tell us how that's different, how, how a farm business is different than, than just, a, you know, how does the farming part of beekeeping play in? Well, there's, there are some different rules for farmers. Um, I guess when you're depreciating fixed assets, uh, you might have to use different lengths for used equipment, uh, you know, seven years versus five years for new. Uh, so there, there's some minor differences like that, but, but most businesses report on a Schedule C profit or loss from business. Uh, farmers report on Schedule F prof, profit or loss from farming. And there's some favorable tax treatments, income tax averaging. You know, the, we, we have the, the progressive rates and uh, if you fill up the, the high, your highest marginal rate one year, the next year you go above that, you can go back three years and fill up the, the brackets in the years before. So you end up getting taxed at one bracket. Hmm. You know? mm -hmm. so there are differences like that, but it is a different form than you would file on for an ordinary business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know a lot of beekeepers, you know, they start off as a, having one hive and then they expand to two hives. How many hives do you have now? 32. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so and now, an experimental one on my kitchen counter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, there, there you go. 32. I kind of did that same trajectory started small and grew kind of faster than I could handle. And um, there's, there's issues that come into play when beekeepers um, grow faster than they're ready to grow. It can be overwhelming in the sense that you have so many bees that now you really, you don't have the boxes, you don't have the, the, the money maybe to expand, but then you have to expand because you just have a lot of bees that are swarming or you need to make splits. And so you, you it just costs a lot, of, a lot of money to keep buying equipment. And then if you, you know, you have all those hives and if you want to treat them with the uh, my treatment, you can spend thousands of dollars on treatments for a lot of colonies. And once you get up to a hundred past a hundred, then, you know, when you go to treat your hives, it's a lot more money to treat a hundred hives than it is two hives <laughs> and, and everything is the same. You know, if you want to buy a new super for your hives, it's a lot of money to buy a hundred or 400 supers than it is one or four supers. Yeah, I and think I when you start to get that big, you need to learn how to make your own and save some money that oh, way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think a lot of people just find themselves in a beekeeping business because they grew and it seemed like, wow, this is something that's really taken off. And whether it's taking honey to the market, you know, farmers markets and I'm, I can, you know, I started beekeeping and as it grew, I intended to make my money off honey. I thought, OK, I can just sell honey. And uh one of the things that has really helped me in my business that Sherry and I have is that early on, I was, I knew that in beekeeping, I needed to have several avenues of income because I, I, one day it dawned on me, if my bees don't make honey and that's my only stream of income, wow, I'm in trouble. And so I began thinking about what are other avenues of income for me? And I thought about, oh, I could raise queens. I could sell packages. I could sell nukes. I could have classes. I could do speaking engagements. I could, you know, I just kind of, I guess, you, diversified all my options and found out more ways in case one of those ways kind of went bad on me. I, that wasn't my sole means of making money. I think 
in a well, business. You hit, a, you hit on something there that yeah. that I think is very important to understand. You're talking about you're you're splitting your colonies and you need more woodenware, like you yeah. were saying. Eliminate the need for that expense and turn it into a revenue source and sell the nuke. Yeah. So exactly. instead of accommodating your growing number of hives, sell them. Yeah. And that then you can forego that additional expense. And yeah. that's how you sustain growth. Yeah. And that's a good point. I, I have some, I have, I give that advice sometimes when people ask me, hey, I, I only want four hives, but they all need split. They're swarming. What do I do with all these extra bees? Sell them. <laughs> Make yeah, some money. Or even let them split, let them, let them swarm. Yeah, you might as well just let them swarm. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's better than putting money on a credit card, especially with interest rates like they are. And I, th I think a lot of people uh, that I see make the mistake of getting too much debt. Yeah. And, and they have a pretty healthy interest expense deduction, but to pay that back, you have to have income, mm -hmm. which means you have tax. So then oh. you're paying the debt and the tax. Yeah, that's right. So take it easy and, and understand where you're at so you don't go too far and end up with a, a big debt and a big tax bill. That can yeah, happen. that's right. And also, Tom, you know, like starting a bee business is, is a little bit different because, you know, it's outdoor. And when it comes right down to beekeeping, if you want to start a beekeeping business, whether it's focusing on packages, nukes, or equipment or whatever, it's hard work. And very hot. Busy. Hot. It's very hot, hard work. Wow. Yeah. I don't think people realize how hard of a job it is. Yeah. And you know that that hard work, if you have help, you have to be careful because if you're paying somebody to help you, you can get yourself into trouble also. You know, is it an employee? Is it a contractor? They have tests for that. Mm -hmm. The IRS will typically say, if you control them, you tell them wh when to be there and what to do, it's an employee. And they're going to want you to withhold income tax and uh, FICA taxes and pay unemployment. And then you need to get workers' comp insurance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for the smaller people, you, you don't have to worry about that. It's a luxury yeah. you can't afford. Yeah, and that's where I am. I don't have any any worries there. But as you get bigger, you you, you should probably talk to an attorney and a, an insurance agent and your tax preparer to to make sure you don't have any missteps because payroll tax errors can bankrupt you. Yeah, boy, that's a good point. I think uh, anytime you have employees that are working for you, you know you've got to have workman comp. That's all yep, it is. Yep. Most places, I believe it's it's the law. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, I've heard that beekeeping has one of the highest, uh, what do you call it, the highest cost of workman comp because of the danger that's associated with beekeeping, too. So that's tough. I know that, you know, we have workman comp, even on volunteers, where you have volunteers that come in and help out and maybe you give them a, you know, something for helping you out, that's still kind of in an iffy area where it's better just to go ahead and have workman comp in case somebody does get hurt. But I want to talk a little bit more about insurance because in beekeeping, I know you're not into insurance, but maybe we can just touch on this. I think it's vital to be insured out of the wazoo when it comes to beekeeping. Absolutely. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, the liability... Uh, if you're not properly insured and something goes haywire, maybe you're transporting bees and there's an accident, somebody gets stung, they go into anaphylactic shock and die. You just lost your house if you're not properly insured. It's yeah. tragic that somebody would die as well, but yes. um, at least you can keep your home if you're properly insured. And, um, I recommend people have an umbrella liability policy and, yeah. and speak with your insurance agent to make sure that the gaps are filled. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that if, especially with, with your home at risk, because I think most people probably have some bees at home. Mm -hmm. And of that's course, the home is your biggest asset. So if you're going to get sued, that's what they're going to take. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. I mean, you know, we're not wanting to scare people. And, you know, a lot, I get a lot of questions. People ask me, you know, do I, 
you know, can I get sued if my bee stinks somebody? Well, of course, you know, you, you, we can get sued for silly things that, uh, I mean, they can attempt to sue you no matter what. Uh, the outcome is you can always, uh, which is somebody can attempt to sue you, but just having that extra, I guess, insurance, it's a peace of mind that kind of tells you, wow, it's, uh, it's important to know that I'm covered in case something tragic happens, you know, because yeah, uh, and may, beekeeping is considered agricultural work. So make sure you have a farm and ranch type policy for your home uh, so that the business is covered. And I would also recommend maybe some product liability. Uh, you're selling something that somebody eats or if you're using the wax and they're making lip balms with it and they get sick for some reason and they blame you. Um, product liability insurance is something to consider as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what do you think about uh, when you when you deal with uh, people that are kind of starting wanting to transition into a business? You know, there's always the sole proprietor, LLC. You can go into a corporation. Um, well, the IRS you, recognizes three entities. There's a sole proprietor a partnership and a corporation. And there are different hybrids of that. For example, an LLC, limited liability company, there are limited liability partnerships. So there are very variations on those basic three. And Coca-Cola, for example, would be a C corporation. That's where the corporation is an entity. It's like an individual. But it has shareholders and directors that control that entity, that individual, and the corporation pays tax on any profit. Um, then when the, the retained earnings are distributed out, those are dividends from a C corporation and those are again taxable. Very rare for, for small businesses to be a C corporation. I do see it, but... Yeah. Uh, the record keeping requirements, administration of a corporation, even an S corporation, um, can be a little much for some people. Uh, you have to keep your annual shareholder minute, meeting minutes, uh, things like that. And if you don't, um, and there's a problem that, that liability protection you were looking for by creating this entity, they call it piercing the corporate veil. They're going to say, you didn't behave like a corporation. We're going to disregard it and they'll come after you personally. Yeah. I see my insurance agent is on the chat. <laughs> Todd Harris. <laughs> I I really appreciate my insurance agent. You know, he's, uh, he's, is really good with bees. He's a beekeeper. Uh, he, he manages our nucleus yards for us. He's a really great person. He and I work together. We work bees and love bees together. But uh, Todd has really helped me understand all the insurance and the farm aspect of running a business, a, a beekeeping business, and the importance of having product liability. On If you're selling honey or anything like that, people can get hurt with things that you're selling or have a problem or something. And yeah, Todd has been a big help. Todd even... Um, is a part of a program and I'm messing it all up for Todd, but he has a program where, you know, the different branches of the government has the, has the ability if you take a, a loss of your bees from a drought or winter or something like that, that you can recoup a large part of that loss with your honeybees. And I think he's worked with a lot of beekeepers, big beekeepers around the country and uh, ensuring bees during droughts or, excessive uh, winter or something like that. So I think that's uh, good to see you here, Todd. <laughs> I have to have Todd on here one day to talk about insurance. So, yeah. Um, well, Tom, what else do you know? What else do you want to share with us about uh, the, the beekeeping? Well, with the side? back to those entity selections, if you're going to start a business, um, talk to your accountant and talk to your attorney yeah. to, to make sure that you're following along with their advice and, and you, your personal accountant is, you know, he's going to know your situation and be able to give you advice. But generally I can say 
if you're starting out and it's just one person or maybe it's a husband and a wife, um, I wouldn't mess with a corporation. I, I think because you get into a situation there where you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. Well, then you're opening up payroll and all this extra expense. You have to file a corporate income tax return. It's not worth it. Yeah. What I suggest is if it's a single sole proprietor, uh, select an LLC, limited liability company, and then disregard it for tax purposes. Then you're just filing a regular Schedule F. Uh, you still have some administrative duties to upkeep the LLC, but it's the simplest way to do it. And if you're a husband and wife, you could possibly have a qualified joint venture where instead of filing a partnership return, you split the schedule F between the spouse, uh, between the spouses. Hmm. And if you're actually making money and paying self-employment tax and it's a husband and wife, maybe you both work on it. Uh, if one spouse works and the other spouse doesn't and does most of the B work, put it under that person's social security number. So they get the credit to build up their uh, social security benefit mm -hmm. because the person who's working is getting that through their wages on their W-2. Right. Yep. Right. Wow. I feel like a lot of people want to just have you do their taxes or do their accounting for them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, you know, you start working bees on the bee yard and, uh, it's hard to, to do the book work. You know, it's, you, you almost have to have somebody else to keep track of receipts and expenses and income. Yep. Uh, we have a lot of people that we, we, we track their expenses for them. Their bank statements come to our office and, and we maintain their general ledger. And, um, it's cheaper for them to have us do that than them to have the opportunity cost to forego them making money because yeah. when yeah. they're working on their books, they're not making money. Yeah, right. Plus, they get frustrated. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, let me bring Sherry in here. I got Sherry uh, coming in with us. Hey, Sherry, how are you? Hello. How is everybody tonight? Good. Good. Hi, how Sherry. Yeah, that's great. Well, I have been sitting here collecting some questions. Oh, okay. So, do you want do you want me to throw them out there to Tom now? Oh, absolutely. I'll go get a cup of coffee. Tom, you're on your own. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Don't go anywhere, David. We need you. All right. So there, there is, Tom, this is a question that people ask all the time, and they write me even at the website and say, what do I do about insurance? What do I do about this? And, and like David mentioned before, we have a fantastic insurance agent who has helped us get through a lot of that stuff when it comes to business. But there are people that have got questions, particularly about what they're doing in beekeeping. Like one person said, do I need to have like a danger bees on the property sign for people who come onto my property and maybe don't know that I have beehives and could possibly get stung? I think that's a great idea. It, it could prevent the need for that insurance. If hmm. somebody knows they're allergic, they're not going to walk around that area. Uh, so, that, so, yeah, that's, that's, just, that's a great idea. That's just something that probably we all should probably have just to warn people, you know, whether yep. they're allergic or they're elderly or they even have small children that, hey, you know, I've got bees here. And so you need to, you know, probably keep your distance, but maybe not be required. Um, I don't know that it's required, but it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. So do people need to have insurance for doing cutout work? Cutout work? Yeah. You know, when they go and they cut out swarms out of houses, you know, and then they've got, oh, that, you know, I then would they're, definitely they're have houses insurance. apart yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, that, that gets scary because if, if you're working on uh, cutting it out of somebody's home, what if you hit a wire or a pipe and mm -hmm. then you have water damage or maybe even fire? Um, yeah. Definitely discuss that with have a trusted insurance agent like you guys do. That's uh, build a relationship with that person and and don't hide what you're doing. Tell them everything like you tell your preacher or your priest in confession. <laughs> um, because if the more they know, the better they can help you. Yeah, yeah, I want to I want to speak to that because I spent many years with a great construction contractor, and he and I 
would spend spring, summer, and sometimes even into fall, sometimes taking out two or three uh, colonies a week out of homes and businesses. And um, he, he, was, he, he is an outstanding contractor, did a great job for me. Basically, he would open up and I would take the beads out and he would close the house up. And I'll tell you what, the danger, when I started, when I started doing that, I was just, I was so is afraid. I mean, like you said, Tom, cutting a wire. Now he was really good. He knew where wires were. He could understand where pipes were. He knew how to disassemble a house without hitting all of that stuff. But what scares the me there though, David is do uh, do it yourself or Oh, yeah, yeah. There, might, there might be something where it's not supposed to be. <laughs> no, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. But I guess what really scared me to death was that when you start removing bees from a, a house, let's say, a lot of those houses are right next to a sidewalk. They're, I mean, they're just like people all around. And yeah, we would try to roll off and happen. say, don't, don't walk here. We'd put up barricades. People would gather just to watch. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. These bees, you know, when you start taking them out of a house, they're everywhere on the on the property, out in the street. They're flying everywhere because they can't get back in their house. If one of those people gets stung, I mean, there's no way to get out of that. You're liable. So, wow, you got to have insurance for stuff like that. Wow. Okay. But what if you're just doing it to be nice? You're just volunteering. You're part of a bee club and somebody in your bee club has a swarm you need to no, remove. You'll be nicely sued. No. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> They'll be nice while they sue you. So uh, the takeaway is probably, you know, even though you're just trying to be nice and you're helping somebody out, you, you still have to, you still have to be covered. In case well, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Um, when you go into a city, they have rules and laws when you're doing work. And sometimes you have to have a permit to do stuff like this. So you need to check with your local, you know, when you do that work locally, you've got to say, do I need a, and that's why I liked working with a contractor because he knows that kind of stuff. He was licensed to do these things. You know, if you're cutting out a hive and you're having to do electrical work and you're not licensed to do electrical work, I mean, you're breaking the law, right? I mean, you just can't go into somebody else's house and do electrical work. So it's really, I think sometimes we just kind of think, you know, it's no big deal. I'm just going to take this little piece of siding off before mm -hmm. long. You're deep into the house and wow. Yeah, it's. That's a good question, Sherry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have got another question, and Kyle wants to know if he's got 80 acres, do you think that is enough um, area to be able to do beekeeping, uh, honey, things with the wax, things with the propolis, and be able to sustain and grow a business? Absolutely. I don't, I, I have plenty of room there. And it depends, you know, what kind of terrain is it? Um, where I'm located, I'm in an old gravel pit that's been excavated. So I have a, a lot of, you know, excavated land that's gone wild. And there, wow. there are huge volumes of nectar in there just in, in a few acres. From uh, Another thing to consider is going vertical. Um is it the uh, basswood tree, the linden tree? Yep, yep. Um, it's my understanding an adult basswood tree yields the equivalent of 20 acres of clover. So if you have 80, if you have 80 acres, you plant a couple of those, you just... You wow, just I've never heard that, but I believe yeah. that to be true. That makes yeah. sense. Okay, so Kyle has come back and he says not 80 acres. He means 80 hives. Do you think 80 hives is enough to sustain a business... And, and to grow from there, of course, to grow from there. But you know, I think so. I, I, would, hives. I would, I think so. I would go um, into the queen rearing and things like that. You, you need to maximize your re your revenue possibilities. Yeah, you'd have to diversify, I think, with 80 yeah, yeah. hives yeah. to I be able to do that. lots of different things in order to do that. So um, another question was, if I'm just a hobbyist, do I really need insurance? Yes. And why yes. is that? Well, it's no different than if you have a dog and it bites mm. somebody. You mm. know, you're, you're not a professional pet owner, but you're still liable. Uh, so it doesn't okay. matter if you're doing it for money or not. Um, mm. The fact that they're there and you put them there can make you liable. And I'm not an attorney, so I can't. 
right. uh, give legal advice, but the uh, right. um, I, I can say you, you should have the insurance even even if you're just a hobbyist. That's how I started out, and I did talk to my insurance agent. Right. Speaking of dog bites, I got bit by a dog yesterday on my bike. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> so so yeah. aggravating. I didn't have my mace on me either. But... You weren't pedaling fast enough. Oh, I was pedaling at 100 <laughs> RPMs, actually. And uh, that's how weird Dogs are cyclist. fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a weird cyclist, but I'm, I'm watching my power meters and all that. But the dog actually, I just noticed it just for a second. Like, there it was, right? And my pedal came down or was going up and his mouth was wide open. But I, I kind of surprised him by pedaling. He got into that rotation and kind of smacked him and he, he didn't pursue me but boy he was biting into my shoe I, that's frustrating but that homeowner can be held liable for that if they actually you have to go to the hospital get stitches or something yeah same with Definitely. bees uh, same with bees yeah. hey i'm gonna go down for a couple of minutes but we do want to thank leah and brian bennett for their donations tonight so thank you for you too wow right thank now. you guys that's kind of you we, yeah we appreciate it very much wow well thank you okay. sherry there you go all right that was some good questions that sherry had yeah that uh, a lot of people are leaving comments tonight about uh kind of wondering about how to deal with bees and beekeeping and all the things that could go wrong um you were, you were talking about the record keeping yeah. And as regards hobby businesses, if you have income, um, keep records of everything. You know, if you're even if it's uh, uh, just a checkbook register, maybe a spreadsheet. But yeah. if you track these things and you know what, where the money is going, you won't get yourself into trouble. And maybe you'll identify some some areas of weakness or strength. Yeah, but you'll need that information to file your tax return because if it's yeah. if you're generating any kind of revenue, the IRS is going to say where is it on your tax return? Right. Even if it's a hobby, you may have to report that. Yeah, that's right. Hey, I I noticed this comment here. I want to I want to address it. Look at this. Uh, Tom says, "I know State Farm won't cover you." with bees, we got dropped by them. <laughs> so that is true. A lot of insurance companies don't like to insure beekeepers. In fact, when we first started keeping bees before we became a business, and as we started growing more, we were in the same boat, Tom. State Farm called us up and said, nah, you need to find a, a, a business insurance company, not us. We can't, we can't deal with that. You're too big. Yeah, that's true. And uh, even... State Farm wouldn't let me sell eggs. Oh, really? Wow. Yep. I'll be darned. Not even if you had uh, a you know license or cert certified to do it or anything. Or well, she just said no. Okay. <laughs> that we didn't go any further than that. I said okay. I only have a dozen chickens. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I I was surprised. I didn't think selling eggs would cause a problem with an insurance company yeah i see yeah yeah todd, todd my insurance agent you know he says if you don't sell your honey if you have the right homeowner's policy it'll be covered yeah that's the key the right homeowner's policy <laughs> that's but, a yeah. great point yeah that is a good point yeah but i like your idea about record keeping you know sherry has a business degree and she's great because she's always saying david need those receipts <laughs> David, I need that mileage. I'm like, I just got home from a conference. It's 1030. Go out there, get the mileage now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's just piles of receipts and it's, that's critical to keep documentation and receipts. Isn't it? It's definitely critical. I wish all of my clients had a, a Sherry in their family. Hmm. Uh, sometimes getting this information is uh, difficult and it's because people are busy. They're, they're oh, running yeah. their business and they, they don't want to be an accountant. I know. That's the way I am. I'm like, oh, no, I need a special camera lens or a special camera cover. And I'll just go on Amazon and buy it. Right. Sherry's like, did you buy a camera lens on Amazon? Yep. Need the receipt. Where's my receipts? I was like, I bought it off Amazon. I don't get a receipt. Yeah, you do. You can print the receipt out off Amazon, David. <laughs> So it's, it's, she's taught me that 
man, mileage is essential. Receipts are essential. You got to have a paper trail. You got to have all that information. It's so, it is time consuming, but it pays off, doesn't it? It definitely does, especially at tax time. If you're organized and have a, you know, a register, hopefully at least that, uh, you can find where all of these transactions were throughout the year and preferably have a general ledger where you're summing everything by category. You know, yeah. you, you have uh, honey revenue, wax revenue, all of that is in one account. So you just have to look at the total. It's a nightmare to go through a box of receipts and say, well, this one's for gas and that one was for mite treatments. And yeah. um, you end up with a big mess and you're going to miss stuff and, um, the only time that's fun is when you can hand it to an IRS agent and say, here, you find it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not fun. <laughs> oh but, my you know, the, the other thing is if you have an actual general ledger and you can print out a financial statement, you can see where you're making mistakes or where you're succeeding. Um, and, and you'll have all the information you need to file your tax return. Yep. And if you are trying to be a... Uh, claim a hobby loss the irs won't let you do that so let's say you spend ten thousand dollars on your bee business and you sell a thousand dollars worth of honey and you try to claim a nine thousand dollar loss to offset your wage income or other income um, the irs says uh you better be a bona fide business and you have to prove it to us mm -hmm. uh, but they'll disallow that hobby loss and if you are really trying to become a sideliner and you want to take that loss, you have to have contemporaneous records. You mm -hmm. have to have a separate banking account that's just for your business. Mm -hmm. you, you have to show that you're trying to make yourself better. That They'll look to see, are you taking classes to learn beekeeping? They will look at that. And if they see that, they'll say, well, that that's something a, a real beekeeper would do. Okay, maybe this is a business. Mm -hmm. If you're operating there's a whole list of things the IRS will look at and you don't have to match every item on the list. If enough of them show that, yeah, this person's running a business. I mean, either that or they're crazy, all that work they've done. So it's important to show that. And if you're not keeping records contemporaneous with what's happening, then the IRS is going to disallow that loss. And you might end up with penalties and interest on top of the extra tax you will owe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good point. Um, let's. I, I like what you're saying about this. One of the things I want to talk about, uh, you know, when I started moving from being a, a hobby beekeeper and then started, uh, we started manufacturing beekeeping equipment, started expanding our our bee yards and nukes and packages and queens and all that. Um, there, there's a point in there where I thought I was making money because you know, people pay you for things and then you think, oh, I made money on this. I made money on that. I sold this. I sold that. I'm making money now. But then, you know, Sherry came along with her expert business mind and she said, uh, okay, first of all, you're not making money. You're losing money. Secondly, uh, you need to change a lot about this business. And so she, being savvy in business, she basically took it over for me and said, okay, stop doing this. I mean, we used to ship packages of bees, right? Across the country. So immediately she said, losing money big time shipping packages. Not happening anymore. You gotta stop that. It looks like you're making money, right? Cause on the front end you get the money and then you ship the bees. But what happens is you try to ship eight packages to Chicago and guess what? They arrive dead, right? So now you gotta ship eight more packages of bees to Chicago they arrived dead. So when it's all said and done, you know, you're just losing money. And so it's, it's, I think it's deceiving for beekeepers sometimes when they see money coming in from their honey sales, or maybe they're selling equipment or something, or they're, they're selling nukes and they see all this money coming in, but they're, of course, they're not paying themselves necessarily usually. And they think they're just making money and that can be deceptive. And that's another reason to keep contemporaneous records. Exactly. If right. you're looking at the at the general ledger and say, well, why the heck is my fuel expense so high? How come our utilities are up through the roof? What's going on? You can fix problems when you see them in real time. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would like Sherry some time to, to make presentations at conferences on, you know, how to run a smart bee business because she, she is so good at that because she's able to look at things and say, this isn't making us any money. We need to stop doing that. We're losing money. It's of no value. It's hard work. You know, it's a, sometimes you have to weigh out. Is it worth me doing all of this work for $1,500 a year? You know what I mean? If you think, okay, I'm going to sell X number of Queens, but it requires 1500 hours to make $1,500. I'm working for a dollar an hour. You know, you need to kind of think that way. It's like, how much time is I, am I putting into something? And uh, when you're young, I think when you're young, Tom, you feel like it doesn't really matter. But when you start getting gray hair, you're like, I don't want to work for a dollar an hour in the hot sun anymore. Yeah, that's where it's a labor of love. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. You have to, you have to make money off it if you're going to try to, to to make it a business. But if it is just a glorified hobby and and you are trying to make a little extra cash, um, sometimes having less profit than is optimal is okay. You're just, oh yeah, I understand. That's right. Yeah. If it's what you want to be doing and. Absolutely. And you're you're yeah. getting your exercise and staying yep. healthy and being outside. That's, That's worth right. something too. But if you want to make a living on it, yeah. and you touched on this uh, in the past, uh, beekeepers have to be a jack of all trades. You know, yeah. you, you can't sure go out and buy every component you need or you'll never make a dime. Yeah, You have to make your own wooden ware and your own mouse guards and things like that. Uh, if you, if you try, if you want to be profitable. Oh yeah. I remember once I was in a bee yard with a commercial beekeeper, right? We needed to haul a bunch of bees in a different state. He stayed up all night long with his son and a welder machine and made a trailer. Huh. Made a trailer. I think it was a two axle trailer. Hey, can you imagine that kind of, you know, ability to do that? Wow. They had the metal, they had the axles, they just, Welded together a trailer. Yeah, I mean, beekeeping does require, I mean, I'm not that extensive stuff, but, you know, I've had big honey rooms that I had to keep, you know, things running, big uh, radial extractors, honey pumps, and double wall uh, jacketed uh, honey tanks and water going through hot water heaters to keep all that warm and all you. Yeah, I can't pay somebody. I'm not going to spend that much money to pay people to come and do all of that. I have to do that myself. Because, you know, honey doesn't sell for <laughs> that much money. Uh, but, yeah, the more you know, the more you're able to do in your business, the more you're able to save money by doing it yourself to a point. One more thing I want to talk about, Tom, is this might be surprising to some people, and it's different from state to state. But in Illinois, when you sell a package of bees, it's taxable income. I mean, it's taxable resale tax or whatever you call that. And I sometimes people will say, why did you charge me sales tax for that package of bees? And it's because because the state of Illinois requires that. <laughs> and they were like, no, it's a it's livestock. You don't charge, you know, sales tax on livestock. And I have consulted with the state of Illinois time and time again. And they assure me anything. What do they use the term tangible? Anything that's tangible like that sales tax. And so we just follow what they tell us and we charge sales tax. But you have to kind of look at the state, I guess, see what that particular state says. But those kind of laws can be confusing. Yep. And in Minnesota, for example, uh, well, food is not taxable. So honey is exempt from sales tax. But, you know, any wax or propolis or anything like that, you would sell the woodenware, of course, if you're if you're selling boxes in Minnesota, that's all taxable. And you can file to get a sales tax exemption when you purchase things for your apiary. Uh, so that's something to look into with your state laws. You know, maybe you can get out of paying some sales tax if you're a bona fide business. Yeah, right. But you're right. If you're going to sell this stuff, technically you have to collect sales tax and remit it to the state. Uh, last year I collected $2 in sales tax on wax. <laughs> as a tax preparer i'm not going to even hesitate to, to to do it to the letter so they got their two dollars <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i hear you hey sherry wants back in here let's drop in and see what sherry has to say hey sherry hey 
First of all, we want to thank Nature's Wild Blossom for their donation tonight. Thank you. Appreciate thank you very that. much. We appreciate yeah. it. Wow. Yeah, good. there we go. Wow. Okay. Now, can you talk about farmstead exemptions? Um, I don't know anything about those, but a lot of times people will write me and say, well, I've heard, you know, and of course it's going to be different from state to state, but in Illinois, if I have so many hives per acre, I can get a farming ex exemption. Are you referring to property tax? That's what I think she's referring to. Yeah. Yeah. It, you'd mm -hmm. have to check uh, state by state. I'm sure it's different, but uh, Minnesota does have a, an agricultural homestead label that can be put on, on property. And if you have different parcels of land, you know, if, 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 if you have raw farmland and it's separate from your homestead, uh, that's going to be taxed at a favorable rate. And at least in Minnesota, it is. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the same as Illinois. In fact, uh, you know, bees are considered livestock. And so a lot of places, a lot, I've had people buy bees off of us that just need to put some agricultural livestock on property. I'm just looking for the exemption. Just looking okay. for the exemption. And so right. they'll use honeybees. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, here, so here's one last one. So how many years can you not show an income from your business, from your beekeeping business? With the hobby yeah. loss, the IRS wants to see a profit three out of five years. Okay. And if you've had three straight losses, there is a form you can file. I'll be darned if I can remember the number, but um, to request a one-year exemption on the assessment of whether or not you're a hobby or not. Uh, if you think the next year you're going to be able to show a profit, then that form might be for you. Um, I have never seen the IRS disallow a hobby loss in my practice. Mm. Um, I know it happens, but we're pretty heavy in the in the agriculture in our close region here. And, yeah. and uh, I think most of them end up making enough money now and again that they they don't have any problems but it's definitely a, a problem if the irs comes in and disallows your hobby loss because you're you, they'll go back three years and you're paying three years worth of let, let's say you're deducting ten thousand dollars a year as a hobby loss and the irs comes in and says no you're going to pay tax on thirty thousand dollars plus penalties plus interest all of a sudden you're broke and the, the, the IRS is not very forgiving. So, but you do have, uh, you know, they want three out of five years. Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah. Right. Good wow. question. Okay. Yeah. That's Thank it so you, far. Abby. Thank you. Yeah. Good discussion today. Yeah. And another thing, if you're going to be starting a hobby or excuse me, a business, um, you have to have a, a business plan. And a lot of people get scared by that. And what I like to say is, Hey, you know, have fun with it. What's the purpose of this? And it, it's a living document. It's not like you're going to write something down and by goodness, that's how you're going to, yeah. you're, you're going to abide by that document no matter what. No, it's flexible. Yeah. Um, let it adapt with your business or, or as with the growth of your business, Yeah. but have a plan and, and try to guide yourself by setting some parameters for what you want to do. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's good. Tom, I think one of the things that with with a beekeeping business or simply just being a beekeeper is that you, you made me think about this, where if you're running a business or you're a beekeeper, being open minded, like if you run a business, a business is constantly changing. You have to you, it's hard to start a business. And even though you might have a plan, there will be things that happen that would be more profitable, you know, like, oh, I didn't really. I didn't see that coming and this is going to be a good way we can start doing this in our business to make more money or stop doing that. So the plan changes. But I think being open minded really allows us to see these things that can be better for us. And sometimes when we're close minded, we miss out on things and, and beekeeping is the same way. I feel like that when we have a closed mind and we we start hearing things that could be better for our bees or beekeeping, we don't want to do it because I don't want to do it because I, I, my mind's made up. You know, I was that way. For example, I used a uh, regular hive tool forever. When J hook hive tool came out, I was kind of 
closed-minded. Why do I want a J-hook? This other one works fine. Oh my gosh, I love a J-hook hive tool. <laughs> I love them, you know. So being open-minded allows us to, to see things and embrace things that could really be better for us to give it a try. I think you have a great point there. And, you know, you always tell, tell your viewers, you know, be a citizen scientist, you say. And I think that open-mindedness and curiosity can help make you a better beekeeper and a better business person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's oh, yeah. always good to learn. It is. By the way, you have to have a shtick, uh, right? You got to have a, a marketing department. Well, um, this beard that I've been growing has become part of my gig. People say, oh, you're the local honey guy with the beard. And I have people walk up to my stand at the farmer's market and say, oh, you're the guy with the beard. You're the one I'm supposed to buy honey from. Oh, wow. It actually, really? it actually happens multiple times a week. Oh, gosh. Okay. So when, when I told people in the office that I was going to be on your show, they said, oh, are you going to shave your beard? They were disappointed when I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to have some uh, drawing, something to draw people to, to know who you are. But yeah, do signs and, and market and use social media. Get your name out there so you, you can expand your customer base. Because if you, you come up with a product and a business plan, it doesn't do you any good if you don't sell it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. One of the things I, I learned from a gentleman that I was... Um, I worked for for when I was younger and uh, he he actually built quite a business around his personality and his wife's personality. I, I always thought uh, I always respected him for that. So his concept, I don't know if he really tried to do it, but it just happened was, you know, if you can win them to your to you, then they're more willing to buy something from you. I mean, that's just a typical, you know, that's that's the way we all are. You know, anything I buy, if my salesman is nice and I like him, I'm more apt to buy it. But it's the same way with when you're trying to sell honey, if you're at a farmer's market or something. If you're a grouchio curmudgeon and you don't want to say much when people walk by because you're looking at your phone, you're probably not going to sell a lot of honey, you know. But if you stand up and stay standing when somebody walks up to your table and you greet them and you say, hey, what do you know about honey? Uh, have you tried honey from a real beekeeper or are you trying it from a store? You want to try a little taste of mine today? I mean, that goes a long way if they, if you can have the personality to kind of promote what your what 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 product you have. And bring an observation hive to the market. Oh yeah, that's that's always a killer in it. Yeah. Kids love them. Absolutely. Big observation hive. Anything else uh, Tom you want to share with us? This this hour went so fast. Wow. Well, briefly um, one thing people should consider as their business grows and you're reporting income, you buy a fixed asset that gets expensed over time. So you buy a truck, it's a five-year asset, $10,000 truck, you're expensing $2,000 a year, for example, um, if you went straight line. You can also elect to write that off in the year of purchase, full $10,000 deduction. And you can do some planning if you have a, a tax year where you're going to take that and write the full thing off and offset wage income that you have from somewhere else. Whereas next year, you're going to have $10,000 more in self-employment income on the farm. Hmm. You've just made a mistake because you're saving, say, 22% tax rate on the W-2 income this year. But next year, you, could, you have 15.3% plus 22% for the tax rate for the next four years. So plan with your, with your preparer about how you do this. Cause you want to, you want your deductions to match the highest marginal rate and, or the self-employment tax. Mm -hmm. and, and there's room, there's room to save a lot of money by doing that. Yeah. Cause once you get into beekeeping and you get that business going, you know, you're going to need a truck of some size to haul stuff around. You're going to need extractors. You're going to need to be spending money on equipment. You're going to need to be uh, buying additional things. So it uh, choosing that investment wisely. I know, uh, boy, one year we, we just got to the place where we had to buy something to move pallets around, you know, bobcats and those things like that. You just have to bite the bullet and buy those things and write that off. Yeah. 
And you can also time that out so that, well, we're having an average year this year, but we're going to have a great year next year. We know that because we have extra inventory or whatever. Buy it in January so it's next year and time that expense with the income, yeah. the revenue. Isn't... Wow, that's right. Yep. Tom, I want to say I really appreciate you. You can. Hi, uh... Jill. <laughs> Oh, you know someone there, huh? Yeah, Jill Lanka. She's the one that work that says, okay, Tom, you've hit your B-talk limit for the day. Oh, no. Poor Jill. She has to listen to all your B-talk at work. Yeah, and uh -oh. she's worried because we have a couple people out of the office tomorrow and Monday, and she said she'll have to take the brunt of me talking about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jill, you'll be fine. <laughs> Oh, Tom, I, I do. I do want to say, Tom, you have been such a big supporter of this channel of me and Sherry. And uh, I can't thank you enough. You've uh, you've you know, when I first started my live stream, I think back in February, you were right in on it and big supporter. Appreciate that so much. Well, yeah, there was my cousin or niece, Claire. Oh, yeah. It, Claire. <clears throat> well, I've been a supporter of yours because if you like something and you're getting benefit out of it, support it, or it might go away. And you've you've had a huge impact in my beekeeping and really in my life. You know, I get a kick out of your coffee times and you make me think, and, and I like that. So I, I wanna support you because you're not just helping me, you're helping thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's pretty neat. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, that's good. It uh, It is good to see a community that, uh, is receiving something from all the work that you put into it. You know, that is rewarding. If, uh, if nothing comes back and you don't see much going on, then you're think, well, this is kind of a waste of time for me to do this. I, I can go ride my bike or something instead, you know? <laughs> so but when people like yourself do uh, get behind, uh, yeah, and I, I think you're right. I feel strongly about that. You know, I always tell people um, that, um, maybe we go out to eat and it's a great meal and they're wanting to be a little bit uh, reserved on leaving a nice tip. I'm like, let's leave a good tip. Let's support the cause. I want this restaurant to be there, be here next time, right? It, I don't want the restaurant to go away. I know that's a whole debatable issue about tips and all, but you know, I it's that way. Even when I take my bike up to a bike store when I have special, I had wheels put on it or something. I tipped my mechanic. I didn't have to, but I noticed by tipping him a little, you know, I gave him 20 extra bucks or something. Next time I called him, he worked me right in. He didn't make me wait two weeks, you know, because it just helps. And people, people are working hard. I want them to be there for me in the future. I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we need to stand behind those we believe in and encourage them. Yeah. Yeah. And the work you do is, is much appreciated and and, and um, well i'm just like all the viewers out there i'm normally one of your viewers so yeah it, it's kind of fun to be be on the on the show with you well Thank great you. well tom it's been a pleasure we are out of time and i know i i was watching the comments and so many people uh said they benefited so much from the conversation tonight and someone said it should there should be a part two. That's the thing about business and this type of businesses, insurance, accounting, taxes, and all that. We have just skipped over the surface of it. It can go so deep. Definitely. We just had an eight-hour farm tax update class oh, on wow. Tuesday. And we felt like we were kind of skimming over some things. Oh there. my gosh, really? And uh, you wow. Yeah, it's good to talk to your tax preparer for some planning um, and your attorney. Make sure you're safe. But uh, I guess tonight our, our hope was to just maybe give some people ideas what questions to ask their insurance agent or their tax yeah. preparer so yeah. that they don't miss out on something. Exactly. Now, if uh, are you available? If, are you specific to your area? If somebody wants to contact you and say, hey, hey Tom, do you do accounting for me or do, does your firm take clients in or are you local to your area? How does that work? Yeah, I'm uh, uh, with Benton Safransky and Company in Thief River Falls, and we we aren't really beating the bushes for new clients because we're pretty full. There's a shortage of accountants in the area, but yes, we we're always willing to talk to new clients. Well, then how 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 would what would you do? How would you suggest that people make the first step? 
who do they contact first to really start saying, I think I need to turn this into a legitimate business? Do I call, do I contact an attorney, accountant? Where, where do you go to first? I would start with their tax preparer because mm -hmm. before you select an entity where you'd need an attorney, uh, your tax preparer is, is going to advise you on the financial portion of that okay. that'll yeah. bring you to the point where you need your attorney but i, I would yeah. start with the with your tax preparer okay good well tom great seeing you buddy i i just uh appreciate you so much well thank you and thanks sherry and everybody it was a it was a good good time Okay, Tom. Yep. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed uh, Tom sharing with us tonight. A lot of you have been asking me questions about a beekeeping business. You've been asking me tax questions on how all this works and that. So uh, that's kind of uh, just barely touching the tip of the iceberg tonight, as you can tell. But at least maybe like uh, Tom said, it gets us thinking and uh, kind of puts a thought on what we can do, what we need to pursue. And I hope you enjoyed that. It is important, I think, for beekeepers to do it right, do it legally, and make sure you're following, you know, IRS codes when you run your business. Make sure you're following local health codes when you're selling your honey. Be safe. Be insured. Uh, things can happen. So just, you know, be sure you're doing it right. I want to give a shout out again to Sherry, who was so helpful tonight, and Jessica for helping in the comment section. Uh, all of you were so great. Uh, so I appreciate that. I noticed Todd, my insurance agent, was uh, answering some insurance questions in the chat too. That's big. And obviously, I'm going to have to bring Todd in here <laughs> in the future. We'll have Todd on here. Todd, if you're still watching, you're going to have to come and be on the live stream because, you know, everybody wants to cover, uh, make sure they're safe and have ways to protect themselves in case something does go wrong. So we'll have Todd in here in the future. That'd be a good topic to talk about as well. And some of his ways of insuring your bees too. So thanks guys. I want to let you know, I really appreciate all of you so much. I love you all. I appreciate you being part of StreamYard. Where is it? Uh, StreamYard B Squad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to be wearing these shirts at the Cayman Reynolds Conference January the 4th through the 6th, the B Expo in Louisville, Kentucky. Haven't checked that out. Be sure and do that. I want to be uh, there with all of you guys. Uh, take a big picture of us all together. So we're going to say bye for tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you guys uh, real soon. Appreciate you being here tonight. Take care.